The Freedom from Religion Foundation's Clarence Darrow Award is not just a statuette. It's a work of art. It's a miniature of the seven foot, the real seven foot statue of, uh, by sculptor Zenas Frudakis that we erected in Dayton, Tennessee in 2017, home of the Scopes trial where there had only been a statue previously honoring evangelist William Jennings Bryan. So we balanced that. And this award is rather eclectic, like Clarence Darrow himself, because it can embody Darrow's many interests, which included legal, free thinking, and of course, evolution and science. Actors John Delancey and Ed Asner have received the award. Both are atheists who were involved in plays about Darrow. U.S. Representative Jamie Raskin, co-founder of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus and known to you as the impeachment manager, um, also received the statuette and it's proudly displayed in his congressional office in D.C. This year we once again chose a legal figure, veteran Supreme Court observer and commentator Linda Greenhouse. You know her for her Pulitzer Prize winning coverage of the Supreme Court for the New York Times for 30 years and for her continuing and important bi-weekly columns for the New York Times. She is now clinical lecturer in law and a senior research scholar in law at Yale Law School. She's received the Carrie Williams Award for her major journalistic contributions to our understanding of politics. A fierce defender of reproductive rights, her books include a biography of Justice Harry A. Blackman and the book uh, she co-wrote called Before Roe vs. Wade, Voices That Shaped the Abortion Debate, before the Supreme Court's ruling. Her two most recent books are Just a Journalist, Reflections on the Press, Life, and Spaces in Between, and just this past week, truly hot off the press, Justice on the Brink, The Death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, The Rise of Amy Coney Barrett, and 12 Months That Transformed the Supreme Court. How timely is that? Linda will be signing copies of her timely new book and just a journalist at the conclusion of her talk. In her column for the Times this year, forthrightly titled, God has no place in Supreme Court opinions. Linda asks, who let God into the legislative chamber? The answer is, we did. Our silence has turned us into enablers of those who are now foisting their religious beliefs on a country founded on opposition to an established church. She adds, religion is America's, American society's last taboo. We can talk about sexual identity, gender nonconformity, all manner of topics once considered too intimate for open discussion, but we have yet to find deft and effective ways to question the role of religion in a public official's political or judicial agenda without opening ourselves to accusations of being anti-religious. Linda is in fact giving, finding deft and effective ways to question the role of religion in the political or judicial agenda. Linda, you are out coming here. You are FFRF's legal touchstone, and we are so grateful to you for your acumen, your empathy, for sharing your wise, frank expertise and warnings about the evolving state of the Supreme Court especially your writings on the Establishment Clause. And sculptor Zenos Rudakis is here now to help us bestow the FFRF Clarence Darrow Award to you. Thank you. Okay, well, for, for those of you who saw the clip of Ed Asner receiving this award um, earlier, saw the clip earlier today, uh, he's a hard act to follow, so. Here you are. I'm, I'm 
glad my husband and I drove to Boston. I don't think I could get this on a plane. It's all brown. It's great. Um, so my, my little talk uh, actually has, has a title. And the title is Cheesecake, Anyone? I will explain. But, but first, I, I, I'm adding a thought uh, from what I had previously written based on what I heard this morning. And um, I, I think the day so far has just been fascinating. As, as, I mean, I, I won't even list the parts of the program that, that really got my attention because they, they all did. Uh, but I heard the couple of shout outs to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, well deserved. I mean, by the end of her time on the court, she was certainly the, the most dedicated separationist um, among the justices. But I also wanted to give a shout out uh, to another distinguished woman who served on the court, Sandra Day O'Connor. And you know, she's, she's not much in the news anymore. Uh, she left the court in beginning of 2006. Uh, she's 90 years old. She's been living with dementia for several years. But I just want to quote from something she wrote in her last published opinion in uh, the summer of 2005 when she uh, concurred with Justice David Souter uh, in an opinion that um, invalidated the display of a, a, a Ten Commandments display on the courthouse walls in McCrary County, Kentucky. Some of you may remember that case. And in agreeing with the majority that this display violated the Establishment Clause, here's what she said. I just thought it was worth bringing it to your attention. She said, at a time when we see around the world the violent consequences of the assumption of religious authority by government, Americans may count themselves fortunate. Those who would renegotiate the boundaries between church and state must therefore answer a difficult question. Why would we trade a system that has served us so well for one that has served others so poorly? Right? That's the question that I think. <laughs> FFRF really exists to answer, right, to, to bring the public's attention to the real meaning of, of that question. Um, so I didn't start out seeking to chronicle the theocratizing of America uh, with the lines that Annie Laurie quoted. Um, I just kept my eyes open, and that's what I saw. And when I sat down to start writing the, my new book, Justice on the Brink, I didn't anticipate that it was really going to be, a, in, in large measure, a chronicle of what happened to the continued effacement of the Establishment Clause and the continued elevation of the Free Exercise Clause during the last term of the court, <clears throat> the term with, three, with the three Trump-appointed justices, uh, which is what the book is about. And the very first thing that happened after Amy Coney Barrett came on the court uh, at the end of October a year ago, um, people may remember it was, it was Thanksgiving Eve that the court on the sh so-called shadow docket um, elevated uh, religion over public health in striking down the uh, New York limitation on gatherings uh, for any purpose, but including the purpose of, of worship. Uh, and that was a flip from the uh, rulings the court had handed down when Ruth Bader Ginsburg was still in that seat uh, where the court had uh, chosen public health over religious exercise. So that was a very major turning point uh, and a very disturbing one. Anyway, even, even were I not receiving this wonderful award, which is very meaningful to me, because I have followed FFRF's um, activities for many years uh, with admiration. Uh, it would be an honor and a pleasure simply to be here among people who aren't shy about challenging the surge in religiosity that's sweeping across our supposedly secular country. So as Annie Laurie and the quote she gave from one of my recent columns uh, you know, pointed out, of course, uh, this is something that I've been looking at closely for some time. 
through the perspective, from the perspective of the Supreme Court. But of course, the court is a reflection, not really a source of this problem. Supreme Court justices don't fall from the sky, and the makeup of the current court is a reflection of our politics. So I don't mean to let the court off the hook for a series of decisions that have placed religion in an ever greater position of privilege that would have astounded our Constitution's framers, to whom conservative judges and justices purport to pay so much homage. I'm only suggesting that we, the people, pave the way to the Supreme Court that we have today, either by active participation or by passive acquiescence in the wave of religiosity that has deposited the most recent justices on the court's bench. What I think distinguishes FFRF is its refusal to stand silently by, as so many people do, even those who, who are disturbed by this. Uh, to stand silent is to enable, and that's the quote that uh, Annie Laurie put up on the, on the screen there, um, Religion, as I've written, is the last taboo, and I think that's proven by who's, I was shocked earlier to see that major TV networks are refusing to run uh, the FFRF uh, ad with, with Ron Reagan. Um, and that's just an example, you know, we can't talk about it. Uh, unlike when most of us grew up, we can talk about all kinds of things. But to comment on the fact that the last three Republican presidents have placed a total of five conservative Catholics on the Supreme Court, I mean doctrinally conservative, not simply politically conservative, because after all, Catholicism is a, is a big tent, uh, is a spectrum, but these justices happen to come from the most doctrinally conservative end of the spectrum, and you risk being considered at best rude or even bigoted. Uh, but to remain silent in the face of this really quite astonishing fact is to become an enabler. So what I admire about FFRF is that you refuse to be enablers. So. so what could I possibly mean by the title of my talk, Cheesecake, Anyone? <clears throat> Question mark. I know that I stand between you and dinner, so I'm, I'm <laughs> I don't mean to put, I don't mean to obsess on this image of dessert, but here's something you, you might want to know. Last month, one of our great federal appeals courts, the Sixth Circuit, declared <clears throat> that Jewish prison inmates have a legal right to be served cheesecake on the Jewish holiday of Shavuos. I'm letting this sink in, okay? You heard that right. The court, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, which covers Ohio, Kentucky, and Michigan, uh, which is where this case arose, a case called Ackerman against Washington. <clears throat> I'm guessing that some of this audience have some acquaintance with Jewish tradition and practice, as I do. For those from Christian backgrounds, Shavuos is revelation, the handing down of the Ten Commandments. So what on heaven or earth does this have to do with cheesecake? This is the story. The Michigan Department of Corrections makes vegan kosher meals available to any prisoner with a religious objection to eating the standard diet, whether Jewish or Muslim or whatever, if they don't want to eat the prison's meat and so on, they, get a, they can offer a vegan diet, a universal meal for prisoners with any religious objection to what they would otherwise be fed. Two Jewish inmates challenged the prison's practice, claiming that based on their religious beliefs, they were entitled to kosher meat on the Sabbath and to a dairy meal on Shavuos. Not just a generic dairy meal, but according to one of the inmates, cheesecake. Testifying at trial, this inmate, who claimed familiarity with Jewish law, first said that, quote, Shavuos is genuinely associated with cheesecake in the Jewish community. But he later qualified that remark to say that eating cheesecake was in fact required by Jewish law. This is not true. I know that this is not true. The district court <clears throat> then ordered the prison system to provide kosher meat to the prisoners requesting it on the Jewish Sabbath and to provide cheesecake on Shavuos. The prison system appealed to the Sixth Circuit, challenging the sincerity of the prisoners' claims. But 
the Sixth Circuit affirmed the district court, crediting the inmate's sincerity and noting that both had grown up eating kosher food at home, I guess before they turned to a life of crime. And <laughs> two of the three judges on the appellate panel, by the way, were appointed by Donald Trump, but that's almost irrelevant, as you'll see as, as I go on with this analysis. <clears throat> so writing for the panel, uh, one of these judges, John Nalbandian, said that while the kosher meat claim for the Sabbath was in fact an easy question for him, of course they're entitled to kosher meat on the Sabbath if that's what they want. Uh, the cheesecake claim was indeed, quote, trickier. The judge observed that, quote, religious texts don't say that cheesecake is mandatory. He did a study of this. He cited a note in the Code of Jewish Law that, quote, some have a custom to just eat some dairy on this holiday. So why wasn't that the end of it? It's not in Jewish law, and so you're not entitled to, you know, more entitled to cheesecake than anybody else, or than a Christian inmate would say, I'm entitled to, you know, nice colored eggs on Easter or whatever. Why, why didn't a finding of no religious requirement equate to a finding of no entitlement, right? Aha, uh -huh. and I quote from the opinion, quote, but there's also evidence suggesting that these prisoners do in fact sincerely believe that the cheesecake is required on Shavuos, unquote. Noting that the district court judge had accepted the prisoner's sincerity on this point, Judge Nalbandian said, quote, that's all that is required. Even if, <clears throat> even if we, may we may have come out differently on this issue, if we were sitting as the district judge, we affirm under the applicable applicable standard of review, <clears throat> unquote. So theoretically, Michigan might have rebutted this finding by showing that the state had a compelling interest in not yielding to the inmate's request. That's the balancing test, the compelling interest that would be required. The state offered a financial interest. Meeting the dietary demand, the state said, would cost $10,000 a year, and they don't, didn't want to be required to spend that. But the Sixth Circuit rejected that as a compelling interest, noting that the prison system's annual budget was $39 million and that an additional $10,000 represented, quote, just a tiny 0.02% in that multi-million dollar food budget bucket. The court did not seem to <clears throat> buy the argument that this was a slippery slope and if you had to provide Shibuus on, uh, if you had to provide cheesecake on Shibuus for two inmates, who knows what Mike comes next, filet mignon for, well, you, you, can, you can figure that out. Now, I'm no expert in Jewish law, but I was actually married, my husband and I were actually married in an Orthodox synagogue, so I'm here to tell you that this is not a religious requirement. Uh, it's fun to have cheesecake on Shavuos, it's fun to have nicely colored eggs on Easter, uh, but in both cases, how did we come to a point where a federal appeals court issues a 23-page opinion addressing a matter that to a person without a stake in the outcome would appear frivolous, even, it might even strike some of you in this room as ridiculous. The fact of the matter is that when it comes to religious claims, nothing under the way the law has developed is frivolous and nothing is ridiculous. Given where the Supreme Court has driven the law, in fact, the chain of reasoning that produced the outcome of this case was completely plausible, even predictable. The case was litigated under a 20-year-old federal law, the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, known as RELUPA. And that law provides that the government must show a compelling interest to justify imposing, quote, a substantial burden on the religious exercise of a person residing in or confined to an institution, unquote. Religious exercise, in turn, as defined as, quote, any exercise of religion, whether or not compelled by or central to a system of religious belief, unquote. So given that statutory language, it's hardly surprising that the Supreme Court has interpreted the law as triggered by any, quote, sincere belief no matter how unfounded. And if all that matters is sincerity, who, after all, is to judge? The law essentially enables judges if so inclined to take themselves out of the role of judging. To this effect, it mirrors a companion federal law, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RIFRA, 
which was the law at issue in the Hobby Lobby case, you may remember, that the Supreme Court decided in 2014. That was the case about whether a corporation with a religious owner could exempt itself from the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare's mandate to provide birth control as part of employee, the employee health care benefit. The owner of Hobby Lobby claimed that he couldn't possibly abide by this mandate because certain forms of birth control caused abortion. That's actually not true. It doesn't happen to be true, but it was ostensibly the man's belief. So the court credited it and ruled in the Hobby Lobby case, ruled in Hobby Lobby's favor to the detriment of thousands of women. Hobby Lobby is a big national corporation with many employees all over the country and others who work for such employers and as a result have been deprived of an employment benefit enjoyed or contemplated by Congress and enjoyed by women who are lucky enough to work for companies that actually are willing to obey the law. So my point in telling you the cheesecake story then is really about a lot more than cheesecake. In context, the Sixth Circuit opinion was not crazy. It was, in fact, completely predictable, completely understandable. It's the law itself that has gone off the rails in full view of anyone who cared to watch. Prisoners can be denied decent medical care, can be abused by guards. Of course, they forfeit various rights of citizenship, including the right to vote, but by God, let them eat cheesecake. Something is seriously out of balance, and by the end of the current Supreme Court term, and you heard some reference to this uh, in the earlier presentations, it's likely to become even more out of balance, and the situation urgently requires our attention. I am comforted by not very much about this, but I am comforted by the fact that the FFRF will keep doing its part. Thank you for this award, and thank you very much. Yeah, I think we, we do have time for questions before the, uh, the book signing. If there are any, I'd be happy to answer them. So, Linda, could you talk about the Dobbs case that the Supreme Court's hearing on December 1st and your views on, on that, what's going to happen, or anything you want to say? Yeah, so, of course, as we all know, the whole abortion issue was infused by religion. Um, obviously, I don't have to belabor that point. So, um, as you know, this case, uh, which the court granted after uh, Amy Barrett took her seat. Uh, I think it would not have been granted earlier. In fact, the court spent many months, and my book chronicles this, um, deciding whether to, to hear this appeal. The court had turned down many such cases before uh, because the Mississippi law, which bans abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy, is totally unconstitutional under current law. So, of course, it was struck down even by a very conservative, very anti-abortion federal appeals court, the Fifth Circuit, just like all these laws have been struck down by all the courts that have heard them uh, because um, they had no choice as lower courts. And the main marker that the Supreme Court deploys for deciding whether to hear a case is, is there a conflict among the lower courts? Is there a dispute that the court should step in and make sure we have uh, one federal law for the whole country. Uh, nonetheless, the court took this case. So the only reason for the court to have taken the case is they want to change the current law, right? If they were happy with the current law, they just would have said, no, thanks, we're not taking this. Uh, so the question is, um, how much change are they going to impose on us? Are they going to flatly, explicitly overturn Roe against Wade, or are they just going to quietly overturn Roe against Wade by enabling states to ban abortion before fetal viability, which has been the, the firewall uh, that has protected the right now for almost 50 years. And in my view, those two things amount to the same thing, because if you breach that firewall at 15 weeks, there's really no principle that would prevent the next day from going to 10 weeks, or the Texas law, SBA, the vigilante law, is six weeks. And Arkansas, I believe, has, has uh, passed or is 
considering <coughs> passing an abortion ban at zero weeks. So uh, the, the stakes in this Mississippi case are huge, and the outlook is not, is not good. Uh, it's going to be argued uh, right after Thanksgiving on December 1st. Um, you know, the court's arguments are live streamed in real time, so I expect many of us will be um, uh, going on to C-SPAN or the court's website and, uh, and listening in. Yeah. I wanted, oh, in uh, Smith versus uh, Oregon, Justice Scalia separated or made a distinction between. I'm, I'm having trouble hearing you, sorry. Okay, is that better? No. Oh, is that better? Yes. Okay. In Smith versus Oregon, Justice Scalia made a distinction between belief and behavior. And he concluded with, if anybody can do anything they want f for sincerely held beliefs, that would make everyone a law unto themselves and would lead to anarchy. So why are the courts not doing that now? Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a rich and really interesting question. So the question is about a case from uh, 1990 called Employment Division Against Smith, written by Justice Scalia, um, <clears throat> that kind of reiterated the old understanding of the Free Exercise Clause, was, which was, if you've got a, a neutral law, that is a law that doesn't single out religion for some kind of discrimination, a law of general applicability intended to apply to everybody, uh, then there's no free exercise opt-out from obeying that law. Uh, and as the, the uh, correct quote that the, uh, the questioner gave, you know, if, if we don't have that law, that, that understanding, the free exercise clause, the other way lies anarchy. <clears throat> So Employment Division against Smith created a huge immediate backlash uh, because the plaintiffs in that case um, were two members of the Native American church who uh, were using uh, peyote in their um, religious ceremony and, and they were, when they were fired, they were actually were drug counselors, so they were fired for using a hallucinogenic drug and they were deprived of um, unemployment insurance because they'd been fired for, for misconduct. So the facts were very sympathetic, and I think it led a lot of people to think, oh, the court is you know, singling out these minor little minority religions, and isn't that really terrible? What's happened in the interval with the rise of Christian nationalism that we've heard about all day so far is that Employment Division against Smith has been um, attacked by the claims, the, the claims that have come up are claims of the majority religion, our Christian claims, our, our Catholic claims. Uh, you know, what you're telling us that, that we don't have a right to discriminate against LGBT people? I mean, those kinds of claims are coming up. Uh, and the court was asked this last term in a case from Philadelphia called Fulton to overturn employment division against Smith. So the, the attack on, on Smith, the, the, um, the kind of metamorphosis of Smith into um, what's become kind of the bane of the existence of the religious right is really reflects what's happened in this whole area in the United States. And interestingly, the court did not overturn Smith. What it did and I won't get deep into the weeds of this, but my book goes into it in considerable detail, is render Smith basically irrelevant by calling on another precedent um, that again had seemed to be about little minority religions and suddenly becomes a tool to empower um, powerful majority religions. It, it's, a, it's a fascinating tale that really um, you know, as I said at the beginning of the talk, I mean, I'm not letting the Supreme Court off the hook at all, but, but it really reflects uh, the, the forces at work in the country that bring these kinds of claims to the Supreme Court. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, considering the following two points. Um, if you take your mask off, I can <coughs> probably hear you Certainly. better. Thank you. Uh, considering the following two points, I wonder what your 
hypothetical reaction might be. Uh, number one, according to the, uh, the Jewish calendar, which references the seven-year jubilee cycle, uh, this year is the year of Shemitah. It's one of those seventh years where debts are forgiven, uh, prisoners are set free. It, it's the jubilee, and it happens every seven years. Now, assuming that the Christian right and many others believe that the Bible is the word of God. If you, how can you reconcile those two without releasing everyone and forgiving all that, all debt? Yeah, so um, I think the government would come forward with a compelling interest. <laughs> and I think the courts would be highly likely to recognize a compelling interest in not releasing all prisoners because it's a jubilee year. And, um, you know, there may be some Trump judges who would disagree with that, but I think the, the uh, majority of federal judges would, would, not, would not buy that argument. But it's, it's a great hypothetical, thank and, you. And if some prisoner had a sincerely held belief. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I take your point, but, but it, would, it would simply trigger, uh, it would shift the burden to the government to articulate its compelling interest, and I think it would say we have a compelling interest, and I think ju the judges of, of the federal courts would agree. Thanks. Thank you. Are, are you willing to share with us briefly your thoughts on expanding the, the Supreme Court bench and uh, uh, instituting term limits? My thoughts on expanding the Supreme Court bench and? Um, uh, term limits. And term limits. Um, well, there's, of course, two quite different things, but they're both part of this conversation that's going on about how do we, quote, fix the court. Um, I'm not a big fan of expanding the Supreme Court bench because I don't see the stopping point to it. Um, you know, if, if Congress wants to expand the number of justices that the Constitution lets Congress do that, but, um, and I get the arguments, you know, the stolen seat that Mitch McConnell kept uh, President Obama from filling and, and, and so on, I understand that, but um, I, I don't see it as, uh, some kind of panacea for the problems we currently have. And the same thing about term limits, although I think, I mean, <clears throat> just speaking as a citizen, I'm certainly open to the argument that life tenure on all of our federal courts, as, as seemingly required by Article Three of the Constitution, um, has a distorting effect on our politics and is basically an anomaly. There's no other constitutional court in the world that I'm aware of that has life tenure. They all have either an age limit or a term of years. Um, and that's true domestically too. I mean, every state has a high court and 49 of them have term limits or age limits. Only Rhode Island has, has life tenure. So uh, there's a lot to discuss there. Uh, the problem is how to do it. And there's a theory that it could be done by simple legislation. Of course, nothing simple legislation, but um, I think the better the argument is it would require a constitutional amendment, and our constitution happens to be the hardest constitution in the world to amend. So, um, you know, these are all interesting talking points, but um, as a practical, as a, to, to be realistic, none of them are actually going to come, come to pass. Yes? Hi. Um, I guess so we obviously place so much dependence on the court system, specifically the Supreme Court, to not only be fair and objective, but to uphold secularism, um, and obviously to implement the checks and balances on the legislative and executive branch. And so they are kind of the epitome of our governmental accountability. And so when the Supreme Court, I guess specifically, is contaminated with Christian nationalism and the system is basically failing itself. 
what other solutions are there in addition to organizations such as this one and education to implement accountability over the system that is supposed to be responsible for Okay, I'm trying to extract a question from I'm so sorry. I thought I was yeah, just what, giving what, a preface. What, what actually is your question? So the question specifically is what other solutions for accountability to the Supreme Court um, are there, or I guess in your opinion, um, to make sure that the Supreme Court is um, when they're failing, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, so, so, I mean, there is no immediate account, quote, accountability. Um, it lies in our politics. You know, if the public thinks that it's had a series of presidents who, and, and, and senates who have uh, served up to us justices that we would rather not have or they're, you know, writing opinions that we don't like, um, you know, people need to pay attention to what happens in politics, and it's a long game. You know, the Republicans played a very, very long game to capture the Supreme Court. It took decades, but now they have. And so they have to own it, right? If, if this court overturns Roe against Wade, that outcome is owned by the Republican Party. And we'll see what the public thinks about that in the next election cycle. I don't know. Maybe the public will be passively accepting, or maybe the public will finally get mobilized about it. Okay, my first question that I have to ask is, do you feel Justice Breyer is going to retire uh, before 2022? Do I think he's going to retire? Mm -hmm. I, I really have no idea. Okay. Uh, second question would be, do you feel Roe is going to be overturned? Do I think it will be overturned? Mm -hmm. Well, as I said earlier, um, yes. you know, that's certainly a possibility, or my view is, uh, if they if they allow this Mississippi law to stand, that's a functional overturning, even if they don't explicitly acknowledge that that's what they're doing. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Hey, thanks. Uh, so, uh, laws against abortion access generally get argued for. You know, there has to be a compelling state interest and can't impose substantial burdens. This is my understanding. Feel free to correct me. Um, but often these laws get talked about by states in ways that are not talking, well, that are pursuing that end, but it's fairly clear that their goal is to just reduce the amount of abortion that happens. Uh, so do you have any thoughts about how frequently or how, how much effort courts put into determining whether the arguments that are made by states are sincere or whether they are just hiding behind some made up interest. I don't know if that question made sense. Wait, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand what your question is. Can, can you boil that down a little bit? Does the court care if the state is giving honest reasons for why they have the law? Oh, should the court give honest reasons? No, does the court care if the state gives honest reasons for their laws? And do they make an eff effort to actually find out why the law was passed or just why the states are saying this law was well, passed? Well, you know, I mean, we heard, we heard Stephen Pinker talk earlier today about motivated reasoning. Uh, you know, I mean, I think judges, maybe like the rest of us, um, can come up with reasons that, you know, sound plausible or, or play with kind of, uh, on their face, look like they comport with the way judges reason. Um, but it could be based on, it often is based on, uh, you know, a, a, a personal value system uh, that they don't acknowledge, for better or worse, for liberal or conservative, you know, just, just speaking as a, as a legal realist. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to think that these judges and justices actually have persuaded themselves that they're doing the right thing, even if um, you know most of us in this room d disagree. Yes. You've given me an idea. I am from Nebraska, where our prison system is terrible. And I have been wondering, you know, maybe we should just say, form a new religion and say the prisoners have a right to water. The water was turned off in our prison for three days. You've given me an idea. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. 
Uh, you talked a little bit uh, when you talked about the Scalia opinion, which voted um, uh, against indigenous uh, religious rights. So, wait, so can I talk a little bit about Justice Scalia? Uh, sorry, uh, my question is, when it seems like the religious exemptions seem to fail when they're against uh, minority religions, and they're more likely to be upheld when they're against uh, majority religions, like Christianity. I wonder if you think it will be an effective tactic to bring forward plaintiffs of minority religions in order to have a greater likelihood in a conservative court to get them overturned. Um. No, I mean, I think, you know, the court, the court will find as a vehicle what it wants to find. So uh, the court gets, you know, six or 7,000 cases a year, and they take, uh, these days you're taking like 65. Um, and if they want to do something to privilege religion, which they seem to want to do, um, they, they have their pick of plaintiffs, and um, they seem to be right now very attentive to the claims of um, uh, evangelical Christians who, you know, can't bake a cake for a wedding or can't, there's a case pending right now. The court hasn't taken it yet, but maybe they will. Uh, by a stationary designer, I can't possibly design an invitation to a same-sex wedding. That would make me complicit in the sin of same-sex marriage. Um, so the court has its pick of plaintiffs, actually. Yeah. Um, it is my belief that birth control and abortion are two different things. Uh, birth control, if a fetus is not created, how can you, how can you be accused of murder? Um, assuming that uh, Trump's Supreme Court gets what they want, assuming in the worst case scenario, Roe versus Wade is overturned, or you know the Texas law stands the whole, all, in its entirety, would it be a good strategy to just challenge on birth control? Because how, you know, it's very disturbing that most pro-lifers are also against birth control. If birth control were available to anybody and everybody who wanted it, a moral dilemma wouldn't be necessary in the first place. So at a strategy of just focusing on birth control and, you know, considering what's, pro what's likely to happen with, you know, future court rulings under, under the three Trump judges, would it be a good strategy to, f to, to fight back on just, a, just for a birth control rights? Yeah, well, of course, the Hobby Lobby case was all about birth control, and the court credited the sincerity of this owner of this major corporation uh, that, uh, you know, he regarded birth control as sinful. And they said, well, if that's your view, then you don't have to follow the law. So, uh, you know, that was a step down a slippery slope, perhaps. Um, it's hard for me to think that the court would overturn Griswold against Connecticut, which was the foundational constitutional holding um, of the right to use contraception. I don't think they will, but I take your logical, uh, I take the logic of, of your question, sure. Your comment that the Supreme Court was taking about 65 cases a year brought to mind something. Um, you and I are probably the only people in the room that think that the Supreme Court I'm sorry, you're going to have to repeat that. I yeah. You and I are probably the only people in the room that think the court shouldn't, Supreme Court shouldn't be packed. But I'll, let's go to the lower level federal courts. They're taking more than 65 cases per each lower level federal courts. There are some cases where the docket is so full they can't really do their job. Would you suggest adding um, just a, judges to those courts, and if so, what's the political trick to get that done? Yeah, well, I mean, I have a, a piece in the New York Times uh, op-ed page today about the, the Fifth Circuit, important federal appeals court that's out of control, and um, uh, yeah, I mean, the fact that the court, the Supreme Court takes so few cases leaves the lower federal courts with a great deal of uh, freedom. 
if those lower courts choose, as the Fifth Circuit has chosen, not to follow Supreme Court precedent. It's very shocking. We have a hierarchical system, and the lower courts are supposed to follow Supreme Court precedent, um, but the Fifth Circuit seems to want to go its own way, and um, it has six, Trump got six appointments on that court, uh, six out of the 17 sitting judges on that court, so this is, um, if I understood your question correctly, this is something we all have to pay attention to, not just the Supreme Court. Thank you. 